All right. Well, we are off to a wonderful start. Just an update. Um, Senator Gillibrand um, has landed. She's in the car. She's on the way here. And she's going to join us right here as soon as she gets here. I've told her assistant to just walk right in and join us. So no formalities necessary. Um, so, but I wanted to call on a couple of... Um, a couple of um, uh, the speakers from the previous list, but I also want to promise you that we have fantastic sessions that will be moderated by Afifa Saeed and Sanam Anderlini that's going to be along the same lines of everything. So don't feel impatient if I'm not calling on you right away because we have the next day and a half together, okay? Um, I wanted to call first on uh, Zarizana Abdelaziz um, and then I will call on Emil. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for the kind invitation, President, Mrs. Carter. I would like this morning to intercede on the question of the uh, enforcement and implementation gap which uh, Susan raised. And in particular, the role and obligation of the state. Now, we have often seen the state, when it comes to culture and religion, saying, there's nothing I can do. It's my people's culture, it's their religion, and I really cannot interfere. But at the same time, we have to remember, states are the ones, actually, which has the deepest and greatest interest in incarnating and perpetuating culture, a national identity, um, in shaping the cultural identity of its people. And they've done this on a lot of levels. And on the second level also, we also know between culture and religion, there's an interaction. One influences the other, resulting in different practices of religion in different countries, for example. The influence of politics and culture on religion and its ability to change uh, the interpretation. Now, in international human rights, there's a legal principle called due diligence. And this principle cuts across the private and public sphere. It removes justifications such as culture. It places and recognizes that the principal and primary obligation in eliminating violence against women lies on the state. And it places the state accountability on the state in eliminating violence against women. And if we look and study the role of the state and we emphasize it, it will address all the issues that you raise, the implementation gap, the enforcement gap. Uh, it will guarantee certainty of punishment, removes impunity. It also is capable of creating a space for reinterpretation of religion. Now we know the efforts and initiatives in interpreting, interpreting religion it can only happen in countries that has the freedom or give the space and freedom for its people to do this. And as a result, it is most active in certain countries. You mentioned Indonesia, which is true. And I've often been asked, why is this work in Islam particularly being done outside of certain Middle East countries, Saudi Arabia, the keepers of Islam, for example? There is no freedom to do that. So I'd just like to remind us all in looking at culture and religion, in reminding ourselves the primary role of the state and our need to hold the state accountable to meet its obligations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine, uh, uh, Emil's not at, oh, there she, there she is, was Emil. Where are you, where are you? Oh, Emil, there you are, I didn't see you. Sorry about that. Do we have the, the wireless mics set up on the back tables? Our sound people? Um, can we get those out here, please? Adam, up in the booth. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I just want to share with the present uh, person, very personal experience. I come from um, a grassroots NGOs who, are, who were address issues of gender-based violence from a feminist lens. I've always have been a very firm believer that actually um, there is no marriage there. 
and um, and 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 that based on so many experiences and and previous meetings and so on and so forth. But like sitting on the table to, uh, for the past and actually moderating the sessions for past two days, I came to say there. I come to see there is ways of really. Um, I wouldn't say use the word marriage still, but I would say bringing us together in the table. But by saying that, I also have to echo some of my colleagues of how cautious, co cautious should we be. Because the word resources came out in the discussions with the working groups. Resources are limited. Resources is not there all the time, and it's hard to find. So to be um, effective in what we're doing and to, to really capitalizing the limited resources we have, we have to really think of what works and what doesn't. And not to continue insisting on things that doesn't work. And sometimes really say very courageously, it doesn't, and let's look for other ways and other venues and other mechanisms and other channels. Uh, so, so one of the things that we, I have been hearing strongly while moderating uh, the wonderful, wonderful group, let me think my, thank my group that I've been helping, med uh, helping moderating the discussion, is the development or the the, um, I wouldn't, wouldn't say development, but like looking at alternative discourses and ways of, men, of, of having these discourses in the mainstream. So one of the things we really need to think of is like maybe not shy away completely from traditional way of engaging traditional leaders, but really thinking of different ways and complementary ways of how to develop alternative discourses and how use also not necessarily religious leader only, but actors in the community to diffuse these alternative discourses uh, in, the, uh, um, in the mainstream and uh, try, this, try this approach and test it because there also have been a lot of evidence base that tells us that the traditional way of bringing religious leaders and do a training on gender and leaving them and coming necessarily might not do might not be cost effective and as, as, as my colleague Marwa said we can end up training 500 and end up with four. So looking at different ways and, and keep searching and keep testing is a really way forward for bringing the two or the four groups, as, as you said earlier, together in a more effective, productive, and also cost-effective, because resources, again, for people who work in the fields know are very, very rare. Thank you very much. Um, I've got um, Christy Vines. Did you want to say something? Uh, Christy Vines and then Dior. Thank you. This discussion is always, these discussions are always so thought provoking. Um, Christy Vines, uh, Executive Director for the Center for Women, Faith, and Leadership at the Institute for Global Engagement in Washington, D.C. I wanted to pick up on something that came out of our discussion that was highlighted by Susan um, in terms of our dependence on uh, resolutions like 1325 and, and our goals on, uh, for national action plans on women, peace, and security. And I often think, um, and this was brought up, uh, and I'll attribute this to Belanle, uh, in terms of when women assume positions of power to really lead on these issues, we often assume that they therefore have the kind of the, the psyche to understand how to lead within a very male framework and a male dominated framework. And often, many of these women who are sitting in seats of power are still operating under contexts of oppression um, themselves personally, psychologically but even more so in terms of the, the construct in which they are, they're trying to work within. And so I do think that there needs to be a greater emphasis that when women do finally assume seats of power and position, that that's not the end result. We haven't, we haven't won and succeeded um, by that alone, but that they themselves need support and they need further um, support just to speak out, um, especially when they're in the minority uh, in, in uh, halls of power. And so, um, and this really, I use an example, came across when I was working on a project called the African First Ladies Initiative. And we look at these women who are in very influential positions themselves, but who often are in that position and have increasing, um, increasingly uh, difficult and challenging tensions upon which they must try to uh, make decisions. And Many of that is, is in a pluralistic society where they themselves are very strong women of faith, but yet they don't know how to actually operationalize that uh, within their own, uh, their own work. And so they often kind of in secret had these conversations, and I 
was mentioning to Mrs. Carter, who was a part of that project, um, that so many of those first ladies continue to talk about the importance of just that one project because they're often excluded because from these types of conversations because we assume or they're put into a position to speak as experts, but often they still want to learn, they still want support, and they still want to be seen as part of this conversation and part of this dynamic. And so they continue to call out for support, especially from those of us who are working on the front lines, who understand how challenging it is to speak out in a very patriarchal context, and, and often where we still are asking for privacy and secrecy and coverage for the comments that we make because of security issues. And so I just really call upon all of us to think about we're not done when we just when we get those positions of power, when we find that women are in these seats, whether it's in parliament, whether it's uh, at the top of uh, corporations or organizations, but um, that we need to continue to include them in these conversations so that they learn to move out from under these contexts of oppression and really, as Susan said, have the confidence to really lead and speak out even uh, in environments where there's incredible threats to their own security and safety. I just wanted to add uh, something that was at the periphery of the conversations, didn't get a lot into the discussions, were new models of leadership uh, for women emerging. And when I was CTS president, I was asked all the time, what is your philosophy of leadership? What's your philosophy? So I finally came up with leadership as a thousand phone calls. And it's a little zen, but I think it works because it models this not follow me guys notion of leadership, which you're the sole individual, but that, and, and we can be one of the people called by women in leadership so that there is more a democratization. And this is coming, and it it's, was mentioned at the periphery of a lot of the conversation, it would come up and then go away. So it's good that you highlight that. And I ask you to put your headsets on if you'd like to uh, have translation, because Dior will speak in French. Um, and I have Timothy on the list, but um, I have someone else ahead of you, Timothy. <clears throat> Please use the microphone, Dior. Can you push the, the button on the microphone? Je vous remercie. Je voudrais d'abord remercier le président Carter et le centre Carter pour cette opportunité qu'il nous offre justement d'avoir, je pense, ce qui nous manque le plus, à savoir cet espace de discussion et de réflexion qui nous permettent d'avoir des échanges. Car lorsqu'on fait un constat, on se rend compte que si les méthodes d'approche sont différentes dans les différents continents dont nous venons, euh, les problèmes sont les mêmes. Les problèmes sont exactement les mêmes et cela fait des, long, des, des années que cela dure. Euh, je voulais simplement dire qu'il est important, et je suis d'accord pour ceux qui disent qu'il faut euh, la collaboration et la conjonction de toutes les forces, et en commençant par euh, les forces, les chefs religieux qui ont un pouvoir important dans certaines régions et aussi de toutes les autres forces, à savoir les hommes. On a tendance à dire que les combats et les objectifs ne seront atteints que si la moitié de l'humanité vient en soutien à l'autre moitié de l'humanité. Et cela ne sera que profitable à toute l'humanité tout entière. Euh, il faut éviter que les violences faites aux femmes soient banalisées. On se rend compte que maintenant, c'est quelque chose qui est courant, les gens, quelquefois même, semblent indifférents à ces problèmes-là, et c'est extrêmement important. Et pourquoi, euh, je pense, euh, nous avons ces problèmes-là Et je rejoindrai euh, ce que la dame, enfin, notre collègue disait tout à l'heure, à savoir qu'il y a un peu cette impunité qui existe. Impunité, pourquoi Parce qu'on se rend compte que tous les textes législatifs sont là et peut-être que j'interpellerai un peu les Nations Unies à ce niveau-là. Il y a un arsenal de textes juridiques, de conventions, de déclarations, aussi bien au niveau international que régional, mais le problème qui se pose, pourquoi, avec tout ce cadre juridique extrêmement important, on en est toujours là Certes, il y a eu des progrès qui ont été faits, c'est vrai, mais... Lorsqu'on fait aussi le bilan, on se rend compte qu'il y a encore énormément de choses à faire. Et pourquoi Simplement, pour ma part, je pense qu'il y a, et il faut poser le problème, au niveau des chefs d'État, au niveau des gouvernements, qui ont pour la plupart ratifié ces conventions internationales, et elle le disait très bien, il faut la redevabilité des États. 
Il faut le problème de la redevabilité des États, les États qui ont ratifié, et pour la plupart sans réserve. Les conventions internationales doivent les mettre en œuvre. Et je pense l'exemple de chez nous, le Sénégal, qui est un exemple justement au niveau de la démocratie, où on a encore des textes qui ne sont pas appliqués, alors que la ratification a été faite sans réserve, ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire qu'il est trop tard pour dire que maintenant, euh, les réalités socio-culturelles nous empêchent de les appliquer. Il faut les appliquer. Et à ce niveau-là, je voudrais demander ce que les Nations Unies font ou peuvent faire. Parce qu'il y a souvent, tous les quatre ans, on impose la commission sur l'élimination, par exemple, je prends la, la CEDAV ou la CEDEF, sur l'élimination de toutes les formes de discrimination à l'endroit des femmes, demande un rapport au pays. Ces rapports sont envoyés. Mais, malheureusement, je pense qu'il y a un gap entre ce qui existe vraiment et ce qu'on met dans les rapports. Est-ce qu'il y a des possibilités pour les Nations Unies de faire quelque chose pour que les États qui ont des obligations après avoir signé ces conventions internationales et toutes ces déclarations puissent effectivement les mettre en œuvre. Alors, je voudrais simplement insister sur ce fait que c'est extrêmement important, car vous savez, pour ma part, le développement, la paix et la sécurité et les droits de l'homme sont interdépendants. Et on ne pourra pas arriver à atteindre aussi bien le développement, la paix, si les droits de l'homme sont bafoués. Alors je pense que vraiment c'est quelque chose qui nous interpelle tous. Et ce qui est important, c'est que nous puissions justement, après ces échanges que nous avons eus, mettre en place un réseau qui nous permettrait d'avoir des échanges, qui nous permettait chacun à son niveau de faire des échanges de bonnes pratiques pour pouvoir faire en sorte que nous puissions peut-être un peu aller de l'avant. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Dior. And just to point out, we're going to tell you more about a network that we're a way that we can communicate um, and continue to work together. So thank you. I'm going to call on Susan Hayward. And um, if I can ask everyone to try to be a little brief so that we can make sure to hear from everyone, uh, as many people as possible, and to speak slowly so the interpreters can make sure that what you say is fully appreciated by everyone here. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate everybody's contributions already so far. I am Susan Hayward from the U.S. Institute of Peace from the Religion Program, and like Manal and a couple others, I just want to lift up the ways in which we engage with the religious sector is needing to be carefully considered. Um, one of my mantras is not all religious engagement is good religious engagement. And one of the negative, unintended, I think, consequences of some of the engagement um, by those interested in women's empowerment and women's rights has been um, a sort of reinforcement of male dominance within the religious sector because of the consequence of constantly going to male clerics and seeing them as the sole religious authorities Um, within the communities. And so one of the recommendations that came out very strongly in an initiative that Catherine Marshall and I did on the intersection of women, religion, conflict, and peace was to talk about, to raise up women's religious authority, both formal and informal, because they do play important roles in formal institutions, um, but also the need when we talk about education, the importance of strengthening women's religious education because we know that religious interpretation, a normative, authoritative religious interpretation is in the hands of those who are recognized as scholars and authorities within the traditions. And as long as women um, continue to be um, not seen or invisible or not heard as religious authorities, then they won't be able to hold the power to help interpret the tradition in ways that can support women's rights or human rights or peace building. And so we need to be putting attention on education, good education, um, but we also need to be thinking specifically about how we can bolster women's religious education. Um, whether or not they're going to have positions of formal authority as clerics within their tradition, just being, having that scholarly background um, will give them a great deal more authority to help shape religious interpretations. And then again, that when we engage with the religious sector, we, don't, we look for and engage women religious, not just male religious clerics. Angela. Muchas gracias por eh, el aprendizaje de estos 
dos días y el compartir de sus experiencias. Lo primero que quiero referirme es a, una, a la presentación que hace la señora Susan en el sentido de señalar que hay estrategias que a veces funcionan bien y de resolver lo práctico. Quiero señalar la experiencia de 15 mujeres en mi país, en Colombia, donde buscaban el agua. Eh, ellas por sí solas buscaron el agua, nosotras acompañamos en toda la infraestructura y logramos conseguir agua para la comunidad. ¿Pero qué pasó? Después de tener el agua, la tierra aumentó de costo, algunas vendieron la tierra, otras eh, querían eh, producir y gastar el agua, más del agua prevista, otras eh, querían, eh, los grupos armados eh, se apoderaron de parte de la tierra porque era estratégica para ellos y vinieron muchos problemas de acceso y uso del agua. Lo que quiero precisar es que es muy importante resolver el tema práctico de las mujeres como el agua, pero quizás mucho más importante ver los efectos de lo que puede pasar al resolver este problema. Pueden venir muchos problemas después de resolver algo práctico y en la planificación es necesario tener presente estos efectos. Me llama poderosamente la intervención del señor Jimmy Carter en el proceso de paz. Como ustedes saben, Colombia lleva más de 60 años en conflicto y estamos en un proceso de negociación entre las Fuerzas Armadas Colombianas, FARC, y el gobierno. Esta guerrilla ha colocado a mujeres para negociar en la mesa principal, estamos negociando en La Habana, e igual lo está haciendo el gobierno colombiano. Se ha creado una subcomisión de género y han invitado a víctimas a esta mesa y a las mujeres a esta mesa. Yo hago parte de una de las mujeres que estuvo en La Habana hablando del proceso y de la importancia de incluir a las mujeres y los puntos estratégicos de las mujeres en los acuerdos de paz en Colombia. Pero, señor Jimmy, es claro que mi voz no es suficiente. Es claro que no tenemos el suficiente poder, porque Colombia es experta en hacer reglas, en hacer acuerdos, en hacer leyes, en hacer sentencias, pero no cumplir. Y es ahí donde tenemos la gran preocupación. Necesitamos que quede claro que el tema de las mujeres tiene que quedar en las políticas públicas, que se tienen que crear indicadores para poderlo medir en los acuerdos y en, y en el posconflicto. Y es ahí donde necesitamos el apoyo de todos ustedes, y en especial de usted, señor Jimmy Carter, de poder incidir con el gobierno en que nuestra voz sea escuchada en lo práctico y que se convierta en aquello que llamamos política pública. I have Catherine Marshall and then Kautar. Thank you. Catherine Marshall from Georgetown University and the World Faiths Development Dialogue. A few points. I was part of the progress that Susan talked about that took us from sniggers about the role of women in development to a genuine conviction that this was a powerful force. And something I don't think we should forget is the role that evidence played. The um, benefits of girls' education, the sort of solid, uh, verified, Lancet-type uh, evidence, and we need to keep on that. At the same time that we have witness and stories which touch people's hearts and advocacy, which I think focuses much more on the politics. But if we don't keep at the evidence, uh, I, I don't think we, we will be uh, very successful. Secondly, a point that we focus on a lot is that there have to be women at all the tables. And people should be shamed when there are not women at the tables. As someone commented, if you're not at the table, you end up on the menu. Uh, and that, um, that is basically a problem that we, that we, we face all the time. And it, it is extraordinary the, the degree to which this is not seen. But not only having women at all of the tables, the issues that we're talking about, the human rights issues, need to be on all of the agendas, uh, and they're not. 
the, the issues of women's human rights violence are simply seen as a silo in many settings. So the canal discussions for Nicaragua, the political settlements in Thailand, the Inga Dam uh, in DRC, uh, the development path uh, for Laos, uh, the legislation on family law, all of these issues, uh, looking to see how these issues relate, I think is absolutely critical. Um, I have Qatar and then Maria. Qatar, yes. Okay. Um, my name is Kawthar al Manager of the Noon for the Women and the مؤسسة مدى وهي جمعية مجتمع مدني عملت مع مكتبة اسكندرية وبعض علماء الأزهر الشريف. Hold on, wait a minute. Is uh, are we good with translation? Can we test? We hear a test, please, from the uh, booth. Are the buttons working? Can you give me a test back there in the booth? Okay, yes, now I can hear you. I'm sorry, Qatar, please begin again. Okay. Uh, my name is Kawthar Al Khouri, and uh, I am uh, the director of a uh, NUR organization, and it is a non profit uh, that works with the Library of Alexandria and some of the religious leadership of Al Azhar, and uh, some of the people who know a lot about religion uh, talking about uh, uh, publishing uh, at the uh, so, uh, about the women in Alexandria. And uh, so when uh, women scholar researchers uh, were present and then uh, these uh, leaders from uh, Al-Azhar uh, together with the declaration of Alexandria has given us hope and that was the uh, of course, uh, thanks to the center, uh, the Carter Center. Thank you, Mr. President, President uh, for your uh, hope of that uh, and uh, work uh, towards uh, freeing uh, women. And I'm very happy uh, that my first uh, visit to the United States uh, is uh, to give a push to that subject. I also thank you, Mr. President, uh, for knowing what ha is happening in our countries, uh, in our countries, but I also would like to ask you to encourage and strengthen uh, more uh, encouragement from the uh, religious authorities uh, towards women. And also, we are in our countries, especially uh, sacri sacred things like the Quran and the Sunnah are for us an identity and existence. So. Uh, struggling with these things and uh, it's almost like uh, trying to pave the seed. It doesn't lead to anything. Mr. President, I would like to ask you to uh, help encouraging uh, scholars and uh, researching women uh, in order to go to start uh, interpreting the religion in a different way, in such a way that will help freeing women uh, and uh, their uh, gender equality and freeing them from uh, verses in the Quran that uh, support these ideas and how can we reconcile these ideas and not struggle with them. Uh, finally, I would like uh, to correct an information that my colleague Marwa, uh, who said uh, something, and then when I went to the website of the Al-Azhar, the uh, stand that the Al-Azhar Sheikh has taken concerning the uh, Jordanian pilot, uh, he actually condemned uh, that uh, action by Daesh, and he demanded that it be killed and uh, applying the Sharia on them. So he is uh, actually uh, uh, with the international community's uh, position, and he's, uh, he also agrees uh, that the international that they be uh, uh, sanctioned just like everybody else said. And thank you, Mr. President. Sorry. Um, so we actually said the same thing, by the way. Okay. Okay. Just yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get that cleared up. Um, Maria, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you, President Carter, for being here, for the honor of being with us. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I, I want to make three short points. One is, um, I know you are aware of the war on drugs in Mexico, but I, I, and I, would, I think it would be very valuable and important to have a word from you in terms of urging the Mexican government to really apply justice and to clean the security and justice system in Mexico, because around the world on drugs, there is corruption and impunity. And that's something that is not very clear outside. My second point is that I would like to strengthen what 
or to support what has been said, that we can work with religious leaders, but we should, and it's very important to work with the community of believers, because there is where we can find uh, the support to urge for the changes needed within religion to support women's rights. Um, and I would like to say something that I, I don't know, it's gonna be a little bit uh, hard, but one of the things we are facing uh, in, in, in the world is the presence of the Vatican at the United Nations, blocking and obstaculizing everything that has to do with our rights. And it's incredible to see how all the governments of the world continue to double their knees in front of an institution that is violating human rights, evidently, uh, uh, covering crimes of sexual abuse and not responding to the commitments that are supposed to respond when they sign and ratify agreements like the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So I think this is something that I hope, because it's incredible to see how 20 years after the governments continue to, to, to fulfill, to follow what the Vatican is saying in terms of um, uh, our rights and the rights of youth to sexual and reproductive rights and also to uh, um, access to information. Uh, and this has to, uh, another point related to this which we mentioned during the meeting that we didn't um, uh, strengthen is the importance of secularity at least in Latin America, the secular state is the only guarantee for the exercise of our rights. Because the Catholic Church, the institution, has been trying, has been not trying, has been influencing public policies so that they can obstaculize the exercise of our rights in all levels. Mike, I have a question is, I was wondering why is it that, uh, because it was mentioned in many of the conversations, why is it that the forces, the policy, the military, who are in charge of our security, are the ones that rape us? Why is it that those who are in charge of our spiritual life are the ones who violate our rights? How much time are we going to spend to really stop this uh, impunity regarding the violation of human rights? Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, when I don't respond to every one, I don't mean that I don't take notes and uh, listen to carefully what you say. Uh, we've been involved in some degree in the peace talks uh, in Colombia with uh, FARC. And uh, my representative, Je Gen Jennifer McCoy, who happens to be female, <clears throat> has been to uh, Cuba several times to participate in that. And, and I work very closely with the president, and I'll send him a message making sure that in the final settlement with the FARC that the full uh, attention be given to women's rights. Also, I didn't mention earlier, but I have been in contact with Pope Francis. I have great respect for him. I, I, know, I knew him uh, when he was a human rights hero in Argentina before he became uh, Pope. And I sent him a copy of my book and also encouraged him to uh, read it carefully and to give proper attention to human rights concerning women. He sent me a very quick letter back, and he promised me, not specifically that things, but he promised me that in the future, under his leadership, that I would see women's role in the Catholic Church be constantly increased. So I think already he's given some indications of that. When he set up a special committee on dealing with abuse of children by priests, as you know, some of the main members of that committee were women for the first time. And I, think, I don't think that he's going to move toward giving women full rights as priests, but perhaps he will uh, consider at least uh, making women be deacons and giving them some authority in the conduct of the mass. So I believe that although, as you say, governments are primarily responsible for the implementation of uh, interpretation of religious scriptures, uh, the governments always have the ultimate authority within the laws to give women equal rights, regardless of what some of the scriptures say in Protestantism and also in Catholicism, uh, I think that Pre Pope Francis is, is uh, very attuned to the abuse of women and girls, and my hope is that he'll do the best he can. You know, there's a limit to what I can do. I, I can't, I, I, but, I, but I don't, uh, I listen very carefully to all of you when you tell me the things that you believe the Carter Center can do, and I will certainly follow up on each one of your requests, even if I don't respond individually to every uh, entreaty for me to correct all the problems in the world. I'll do the best I can. Thank you. Um, 
Um, I just got a text that Senator Gillibrand is pulling in. <laughs> so as she, until she walks in the door, I just want to say um, to President Carter and Marianne and, and all of us, um, what we decided with uh, yesterday at the end, when we saw the list of, of ideas that yes. was emerging, Columbia, all of these things, yeah. we asked everyone to think about what they can ask for us. Uh, we had something from Nicaragua. We had ah. something. So I'm collecting, um, you know, to-do lists. And some of them we can do. Some of them we can refer to others who are better suited to do those. But what, I, but what we're committed to is to hear each of you. We had one of our guests from Nigeria say, help us with the Chibok girls. Help us with Nigeria. Help us with Boko Haram. And what we're committing to do is to start those conversations and work with you over time to get the resources and to, to help solve it from your perspective so that you get... Uh, what you need. Um, so, so I don't want, uh, it's, even though it sounds sometimes everyone's speaking and we have a long list, I don't want you to get overwhelmed because we're cataloging, cataloging all of it and we're going to work through it and f find out how we can, how we can um, help you. I'm, now I'm stalling because she was supposed to walk through the door all dramatically. Um, so I'm going to, um, as, as soon as um, Senator Gillibrand comes in, I'm going to turn it over to here she comes. Right. <laughs> Come on, join us. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Jessica Newworth to start us off. But first, let's give a wonderful welcome to our senator from New York. And she's the latest victim of our weather problems. No, I know. We, we've had weather catastrophes all over the United States, um, but we are so delighted to have you. Um, and I know we only have a short amount of time with you, um, so we're going to use the time well, okay. I promise. Okay. Um, at first, I wanted President Carter to have a chance to, to offer any greeting remarks, and then I will... And Mrs. Carter? <laughs> well, I'm not going to take much of uh, Senator Gillibrand's time. But I think that it's accurate to say that in the United States uh, government, and I would include maybe the White House as well as the Congress, we have one sterling champion for basic human rights concerning women and girls, and that's uh, Kirsten Gillibrand. I've met with her earlier at a major women's conference and talked to her then briefly, but uh, she is trying to root out as best she can in legal ways some of the oppression of women and girls that exist in our own country, in the military and in the universities and so forth. And so without further delay, I'm going to turn the microphone over to her and let her tell us what she's doing and what she hopes to do in the future and how the Carter Center and all of you here assembled can help her with her project in the United States. Because as I said earlier, what the United States government does uh, has a profound effect on all your countries and dealing with the United Nations and so forth. So, Senator Gillibrand, we are delighted to have you and very grateful for your coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I am extremely grateful to be part of this amazing group of people here uh, who are talking about one of the most important issues that our world and our communities can face, and that's the empowerment of women and ending gender violence. Um, I loved your la latest book, Mr. President, uh, A Call to Action, something that is very much uh, close to my own heart, I wrote a, a book uh, called Off the Sidelines, which was my call to action, to ask women's voices to be heard. And I think the notion of what we're just talking about today is why women's voices are so important. That in fact, women's life experiences are very different. Women's perspectives are different. Their priorities are different. And when you have women's voices heard in combination with male voices, you have all perspectives being uh, really being represented. So not only are the issues raised different, but the solutions offered are different. And through those issues and through those solutions, we have a resulting stronger community, stronger governments, stronger economies. And so the two issues that I've been focusing on with regard to violence uh, is sexual assault in the military and sexual assault on college campuses. And the problems are not dissimilar in that what you have in both arenas is institutional bias that covets and protects the favored. So for example, in the military setting, you have uh, decision makers and all decisions resting solely in the hands of commanders. Uh, they are not lawyers, they are not necessarily trained, they uh, may have biases, they are not objective, they are not 
Uh, in that instance, justice is not blind. And because of those biases, they will protect the favored, whether it's the favored soldier, the favored officer, the one who's more valuable in combat, whatever their particular lens may be, their best buddy, whoever. But they don't focus on rendering justice, blind justice, which frankly every man and woman serving in our military deserve. They deserve a military justice system as, as uh, strong and as fair as the service that they are giving our country. They deserve it. Now, in the college campus setting, it's not dissimilar either. Oh, it's a little slower, sorry. In the college campus setting, it's not dissimilar. Uh, in the college campus setting, you have institutions, universities, that are more interested in protecting the reputation than protecting the rights of a survivor. They're more interested in protecting that star football player than they are in int interested in protecting the rights of the survivor. And so you see this institutional bias, again, whether it's the military, whether it's college campuses, whether it's the NFL, uh, where institutions will uh, close ranks around the favored and that inevitably is not the woman. It is not the survivor, whether he, he or she be male or female. And so uh, I've created this uh, narrative in Washington as a way to bring people together to make a very bold statement that we value our women and girls. And that's what this is all about. Do you value women and girls in your society? And if you need any proof that even in America we are not valuing our women or girls, just look at how much they're paid for the same work as men. If you don't even have equal pay for equal work in your country, you have a very clear bias against the value of women in society. When you don't support them in the workplace, whether it's through paid leave or affordable daycare or universal pre-K, those are barriers, real challenges for women to reach their full potential. And so I'm very grateful, Mr. President, for you hosting this forum with such extraordinary opinion leaders, uh, advocates in their own nations, and their own communities that are changing the world and have been for decades. And so together, I think we can make progress on these issues. Thank you, Senator. Oh, uh, for passing the bills. I'm very optimistic, actually. The college campus setting is one that seems to really resonate with many members of Congress, uh, regardless of party, because they see their daughters going to college. They see their community suffering. They see their own alma maters making poor decisions. And so it's something that's relatable to them. They can see it in their own life. And I think when we have a vote on sexual assault on college campuses, we will prevail. I believe we can actually transform the legislation. And just briefly, what the legislation does is changes the incentives for the institutions. Instead of slaps on the wrist for not reporting these violations, it has very heavy penalties. Uh, instead of uh, having an opaque system, it asks every student to fill out an online questionnaire that's confidential to discuss what the climate is like at each of these schools. Uh, it allows for uh, better working between universities and criminal justice. Because for many survivors, the criminal justice system isn't working either. And so if we can make sure universities collaborate in advance through memorandums of understanding, then you'll have a plan in place about what you're going to do when a rape occurs on campus. So I'm optimistic. And then sexual assault in the military, it's somewhat more difficult because you're really pushing up against a very powerful institution called the Department of Defense. Uh, and they like to do the way they like to do things. Uh, we've had the same challenges with overturning Don't Ask, Don't Tell, with integration women into combat, with integration of the armed services. All of those challenges were ultimately overcome, but it, it was not overcome easily. And the same excuses of that would undermine good order and discipline are being used in this context as well. The same story, the same lack of movement, the same embracing of the status quo. But I think as we build momentum with the college campus fight, we will continue to build momentum against the status quo within the military, and we will finally get to a, the zero tolerance policy that our men and women actually deserve. Can I ask another question? How do you assess the support or potential support of the president and a new Secretary of Defense? Well, uh, I spent my time, I am a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. So when our prospective defense secretary came to be uh, questioned by the committee, Ash Carter, I spent my time on this issue. And he said several things that I thought were highly relevant. He agreed that 20,000 sexual assaults, rapes, and unwanted sexual contact last year was not 
good order and discipline. He agreed that because of the 62% retaliation rate of survivors who did come forward, 62% were retaliated against. He agreed that that did not meet the zero tolerance policy that our commanders had promised. And he also agreed that he would allow all solutions to be on the table. And that while we can recognize that um, chain of command is very important in combat settings, it's not necessary in terms of adjudication of the criminal justice system. That in fact, leaving that to trained military prosecutors would result in better decisions. So the fact that he's willing to keep an open mind on that issue means I think he is open to really studying the issue and perhaps becoming an advocate. The president um, obviously uh, takes this issue very seriously. He's made many very bold public statements about it, but I still am trying to convince him with my audience of one that as commander in chief, he should not be supporting decision making for serious crimes within the chain of command. And so I'm still working very hard to convince him and the White House of the merits of this proposal. And you know, to be perfectly frank, it's not a silver bullet. It will not change the climate or the status quo overnight, but when you improve a justice system and create opportunities for transparency and accountability and reliability, then you will increase people's uh, faith within that system, which will hopefully allow more than two out of 10 victims to come forward to report the crimes committed against them. Could you explain to this group just what you're trying to do by taking the away from So in, in we, we have many allies in the world community on military issues. They include Australia, Canada, Israel, um, the UK, um, Germany, uh, the Netherlands. All of those countries have already decided that men and women in the military did not have true civil liberties because all legal decisions were being made by the chain of command. They have since taken all serious crimes out of the decision making by the chain of command and given it to trained military prosecutors. When they did that, they did not experience less good order and discipline or less ability to control and train troops. Uh, but what they did do is instill a better system for criminal justice. I'm advocating that we do the same thing. It's been done before, we can do it again. When we were at, arguing for don't ask, don't tell repeal, meaning a member of the military could serve as an openly gay member, our allies had already removed their restrictions as well and showed their military still functioned. So we have the same argument here. And I want that decision to be made by a prosecutor who doesn't know the accused, who doesn't know the victim, who has no skin in the game, whose job only is to determine is, is there enough evidence to prosecute this case? Not, is he my favorite soldier? Is he my drinking buddy? Oh gosh, he couldn't have done this. He has a wife and two kids. That is typically what informs many decisions with within the current system. We need that person to decide those cases solely on the facts, not on whether they value the perpetrator more than the victim. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. I think, you know, this is an example of what we can achieve when uh, women who are, who are prepared to lead on women's issues um, are a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee and these important institutions. So we're so excited to have you here and I don't want to lose any time. Um, on Just one uh, uh, possibility that occurred to me as I was listening to you, uh, the Carter Center has been invited to co-convene an effort in Boston on sexual camp campus sexual assault by the universities in Boston as a result of President Carter's trip to Boston. A number of people at the universities, and there are more college campuses in Boston than any other city. And we hope you'll work with us on that uh, effort. Um, um, now I'm going to, what we have here, and I, you only have a short amount of time, is assembled an amazing group of people, and we've just picked up a couple of people to sort of help frame for you what we're up to. Um, next week, a delegation, small delegation of us will be in Washington and we're tr trying to see the women senators, so maybe you can help us uh, 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 secure an appointment with the women senators because we have a big message and we'd like to come deliver it. I'm going to ask Jessica Neuwirth, uh, for, uh, previously from Equality <coughs> Now, to frame for us how, how this discussion has been going. Um, and you mentioned the Defense Department. There's a little bit that we were, uh, that has to do with the Defense Department that Jessica might, might touch on and, and uh, our next speaker from uh, this UN, uh, the a African Union Special Envoy for Africa. So Jessica, get us started. Okay, thank you. Now, I, I have to start by thanking again the Carter Center for bringing us together and President Carter for his really strong statement of uh, 
support this morning for all of the issues that we're working on, and, and Senator Gillibrand for her inspiring leadership in the Senate. It's, it's, it's just like music to, to listen to all of this. Um, but it's not loud enough. <laughs> At this point, I think we've been talking for a couple of days about women, peace, and security, and it's not a new subject, of course. And I think um, what we see is there's a widespread rhetorical recognition of the value of women in resolution of conflict. It's, it's not new. It's the 15th anniversary of Resolution 1325. It's the 20th anniversary of Beijing. And as President Carter noted this morning, 1325 has yet to be carried out. Slow down, okay. So it's not working. And there's really no accountability for the failure to implement Security Council Resolution 1325 or any of the other resolutions that have followed it, which there are many. And the result of that failure is that the wisdom and experience of women is not getting into the conflict resolution processes at the highest level. I uh, spoke with a woman from the Syrian Women Forum for Peace who told me not too long ago, unless, unless, you, unless you have a gun, you can't get into the UN peace talks. That's something we all know in the women's movement, that since 1325 was passed, we've been knocking on the doors of the UN, but the doors don't open. So that, um, that really says something about the approach that's being taken by the international community. And it's an approach that really perpetuates the cycle of violence, because if the international community is inviting in while leaving us out all the men with guns to represent their countries in peace talks, then the international community is effectively empowering the people with guns rather than the people who would resolve conflict by peaceful means. And it's wonderful to be in Atlanta and we got a chance to go to the Martin Luther King Museum, you know, and, and you, you hear those poetic words about violence begetting violence. And I think President Carter was quoted this morning on saying, how do we overcome oppression and violence without resorting to oppression and violence? And over the past few days, you know, we've had a lot of uh, challenging discussions uh, about Nigeria and other situations where sometimes it seems like the use of force is necessary. And Nigeria might be an example. But we need to, we need to frame, we need to, we need to reframe the way in which we use force into one that really is compatible with the rule of law. And we want force to be used in a way that's not a component of war, which just perpetuates the cycle of violence, but a component of law enforcement, which would effectively end impunity for violence against women and for all violence and conflict. Um, and I, I can't, I can never say rule of law without uh, taking the opportunity to remind us that in terms of the normative framework here in the US, we, we still are one of seven countries in the world that hasn't ratified CEDAW. And, um, and we're really one of the few countries that has a constitution that does not prohibit discrimination against women. Although I have to also mention that President Carter uh, signed CEDAW in the 1970s. Uh, it just has yet to be ratified by the Senate. And President and Mrs. Carter also strongly supported the campaign for the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. So actually here, we're, we're, we don't have the same, at the highest level, we don't have the normative legal framework uh, here in the US that other countries have. But of course, we have very strong laws. I think you know the military code of conduct prohibits sexual violence. That's not a question. So the challenge that we have that I think everybody in this room is facing is impunity. And what Senator Gillibrand called institutional bias, or what we might call lack of political will. And you know the measures that, that Senator Gillibrand described, I think, are efforts to try to shift that imbalance and to create more political will for prosecutions, because the law is not the problem. It's the law enforcement. And in many countries, all of that is compounded by the great problem of corruption, because that makes impunity even more rampant and law enforcement even more difficult. Uh, so getting depressed with all of that, we tried to think about solutions over the last few days and look at some models of success which we did find, and, and most of them really, uh, in our experience, relate to the political mobilization of civil society, and particularly women. We looked at Liberia, where you have women really coming together on their own, surrounding the peace talks, and insisting that something come out of those peace talks successful. Uh, we talked about some of the very well-publicized rape cases in India and Tunisia, where women took to the streets and, and men and really demanded justice, and those were some of the few cases where justice was done. Uh, although we noted in, in Nigeria and in many countries, it's not easy to take to the streets, and that it's really important for us to all be able to enjoy the rights to freedom of expression and freedom of association. So um, 
So I think our sense was we really need to shift the balance of resources and power and support to, to civil society and in particular to women's groups. And we talked a lot about the potential for support in political mobilization from religious and community leaders and also uh, the kind of uh, public support that leaders like President Carter can, can offer at the highest level to really help shift the stigma from victims to perpetrators. Uh, I, I was in, in, in a remote village in the Congo and a woman who had been raped asked me, you know, has the president ever, Pre President Kabila, e ever spoken out against sexual violence? Doesn't he care about what's happening to us? You know, and I think that that moral force is, is being used in the wrong way and, and could really shift the balance. So. So I think we all ended up with the, also with the title of President Carter's book, A Call to Action, that that's what we need. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And um, our next speaker is the, U, uh, the African Union Special Envoy um, on Violence Against Sexual Violence in Conflict and has been recently to Somalia, Sudan, Nigeria, and we want to hear uh, uh, from her. I just want to say one thing first. We had a lot of, Jessica just mentioned resources. It will take something like a trillion dollars to update the aging nuclear arsenal. And the president has been trying to decide how to deal with that. This is a, a, nuclear, a nuclear arsenal that we hope never to use. Yet a trillion dollars is being considered for allocation. If we think about a tenth of that towards women, girl, education of women's and gir women and girls, uh, towards, the, towards police training, the, the rule of law, that is missing and creating terrorism. Just think. So let's try to shift. We, we were like trying to say we're, we want to shift people's mindsets from fear to confidence, because we're confident in what works. We actually know what works, but we don't have the resources. Um, so for that, I'd like to talk to, uh, turn to Benetta Diop, who led a, a Senegalese, a very important Senegalese women's rights organization for years before she joined the African Union. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, let me first of all um, thank um, President Carter and uh, Madam Carter. Um, indeed, you have done a lot in our continent in Africa. Um, concerning our democratic processes, but also our peace um, elections in Liberia. I met with you. I was conducting a 20 women that was observing election in 1997 with Mrs. Carter. Um, and I think you contributed a lot in the Carter Center on um, the democratization of our continent as well. So I'm here today to say that starting from what Jessica said, I will start with some of the solutions that we have done in the continent first. Very briefly, Liberia is one example because the women's rights movement have done a lot in Africa. Um, the peace movement have done a lot in Africa. African women are resilient and they have been the backbone of our society. Um, the, yesterday I talked about the protocol of women's rights with Grasa Marshall. We fought to get it right, the Maputo Protocol. We have fought to get the parity principle, which is applied now, now that we have Madam Zuma at the African Union Commission. We have Rwanda, which is doing, the women are the ones who pick up the pieces of the Rwanda after the genocide. We have seen even my country, Senegal, we have more than 40% of women in our parliament. But yet, despite all this, we can say that a lot need to be done again, a lot, in the continent. We have few phenomena. Karen have named my recent visit in Somalia. Uh, what Senator Jerry Brown said, we have the same thing. We have AMISOM in Somalia. But what we know that we need the solid zero tolerance for our combatant because they, we need them to protect the people. Some of them said, the women, we might need female police. This is what we want, why did? Because we, when we see the soldier, the face of the soldier, it reminds us maybe what we are fighting against. That's the reality on the ground. When we are asking for women to be part of the military apparatus, but sometimes we don't think about how we should provide them space 
an environment for them to be exercising rightly what we ask them to do. I was a member of the Commission of Inquiry on South Sudan under the leadership of President Obasanjo. We just finished our report. The issue of impunity have been discussed here. What do we do with that? This is a big issue. Our report is not yet out. I cannot discuss it in public right now. But what we know is the women of South Sudan are saying we need to break the cycle of violence. And we need certainly maybe to reconcile, but we need justice. And that is things that we really see that there is a need to address that. New phenomenon, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram. I was in Nigeria recently, in December. Um, my sisters are here from Nigeria, but all of them are involved in fighting in their own rights. But what I, I met, Shiba girls that have returned. I have met mothers that are still waiting. I close the door with them and start asking, what are the issues? Mother said, I don't sleep anymore. I don't know where are my girls. And yet I have to take care of my family right now because I have other children. The Shibo girls herself, she said, I want education. She met Malala, she met other people, but she said, I want education. Could people help me to stay at school? And all of them who came back, what do we do on this? I think that um, we have a wake-up call by the, uh, what President Carter has done, the book, Call for Action. It's a wake-up call for all of us. Um, but maybe we need to also look how do we prevent. The root cause of conflict, we see it coming, but we don't invest. We don't invest enough. We prefer that it is there, that we have the military, which is very costly. I don't know how many billions are going to be put on this uh, uh, Boko Haram and uh, others. It costs a little to support women's groups. It costs little for educating the girls. It costs little to have a hospital in the remote areas. It costs little to have a school where you can, it costs a little to bring even back women in agriculture um, that we know and the young people who are looking for jobs. It costs a little for that but we are investing more on military. We are investing more while we look into other means, human security issues. So maybe we need to think differently, not just the African, but the global world. How do, why are we doing it wrong? Why are we missing? Where are we missing? We need to ask that question. And um, I don't have a lot of answer, but yes, I don't have a lot of answer. But what one of the answer, I think, the fact that we are here um, with the President Carter having dialogues, you know, starting with the in Liberia, in, in uh, Nigeria, for example, uh, with Muslim and Christian having this kind and the civil society and the women's group. This kind of forum should continue, not just here, but I think we should also take it on the ground in some of those countries. The website we had yesterday was great, but please come back to Africa, be there with the elders, with the community, the religious groups, and the women and the civil society. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Benita. Thank you so much. And to keep that going, I'm, I want to hear from two more people if we can, because Fatima has come all the way from Iraq. And what we have committed to do is to provide a, a space for women who are facing these challenges to speak. So Fatima, can you, and you'll need your earpiece because she's speaking in Arabic. So. 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, to start, I would like to thank you very much. To start with, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your invitation uh, to attend uh, this wonderful uh, meeting and also to uh, fight uh, violence in all its uh, aspects. I would like to address you, uh, Mr. President, and tell you I am 45 years old, and since I am 10 years old, I have been dreaming of uh, peace. In the first 10 years, uh, there was the war, war between Iraq and Iran, followed by that, the Gulf, the first Gulf War, and then the devastation, the psychological and the damages, and also the fall of the regime and all the negative uh, accumulation that made us always dream of peace. Sir, Mr. President, I would like to tell you that in spite of all these sufferings, uh, we are now, we live uh, through uh, m even more difficult uh, situations because of uh, um, uh, terrorism and internal dis, uh, the displacement and uh, violation of women's uh, 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 persons uh, fill in the uh, some at this point we don't even in the past we never really distinguished who was Muslim uh, or um, um, uh, Christian and uh, w uh, whereas now everything is uh, really done in the name of uh, uh, religion they for they forbid girls from going to school because of religion but that does not mean that we we are standing there uh, not doing anything. However, we are try we have uh, organized uh, women's organizations and we have also worked on women's education and uh, uh, supporting women uh, politically and economically. When uh, we have uh, initiated the many initiatives uh, that join between uh, uh, scholars, uh, men of the clerics and other organizations, we have done a lot, but we are still uh, uh, but we still need a lot. What I would like to ask you, Mr. President, is uh, to uh, support all the initiatives uh, for uh, peace, especially in what regards uh, women, and that would be through the uh, enforcement of international uh, treaties and conventions, in, and also to put an end uh, to stop uh, uh, extremism in Iraq. What I would like to tell you, and that's the most important thing, uh, my mother said that America is great, and that, uh, of course, something that has stayed in my mind, and the uh, great uh, America is great uh, when uh, you liberated us from Saddam's regime. However, uh, now I'm asking myself, is America, America still is great, uh, great enough uh, to liberate us from uh, terrorism and uh, also uh, the neighboring countries that uh, support uh, terrorism and uh, help us uh, uh, help uh, women's organizations uh, that have initiatives for peace? And thank you, Mr. President. And we'll have one more speech. Senator Gillibrand has to leave, um, but um, her staff have promised me that we're going to stay in touch. Um, but before she leaves, I want to send them under Lini to, to talk to us about all of uh, what we're doing to, to make these connections. Thank you very much. My name is Sana Mandarlini. I'm uh, the co-founder of the International Civil Society Action Network. Um, it's really a privilege to be here with you. I wanted to um, bring this back in terms of ICANN is a very small organization and we go on the principle of what can I do and, and then what can we as, as networks and individual networks do. So that the notion of the I is very, very important for us. And I wanted to bring this conversation back to the US. We have a Women, Peace and Security Act currently sitting in the world that you inhabit. Um, I don't quite know how it works. But in that Women, Peace and Security Act, um, there is language about the importance of doing gendered impact assessments in terms of how US foreign and military and development policy affects women around the world. It's really important because when we have sanctions imposed, the implications for women are profound. When we have the kinds of things that have happened in Iraq, it's profound. So we can't, on the one hand, say we believe in women's rights and then impose policies and actions that have a devastating impact the hypocrisy is too obvious and it delegitimizes us. So if we could have that act also on your desk, it would be wonderful. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is um, we are in the process of developing at ICANN something called the Better Peace Tool, which is really about how to get inclusion of women in peace processes. It's very simple. I have it here. 
I think the U.S. could take a lead on doing this properly, again, because we need the leadership. And, and it's, a, it's a very basic how-to of, and it makes a difference because you're present in Afghanistan it, with Syria, with Libya, across the U.N. system. Um, let's just do it. We don't need to aspire. We, we can actually um, uh, do this. Similarly, US, the U.S. does a lot of peacekeeping training across Africa right now. Every time we ask them, what are you doing around issues of human rights and gender issues? For example, for, for in, in terms of UNISOM, I worked in, with Somalis. It was an open secret that UNISOM was involved in the trafficking of girls and women. It, everybody knew it. Um, you know, but we don't talk about it. Um, and I, I guess now it's on webcast. Oops. Um, uh, <laughs> I hope it stopped. I, I, I hope that it stopped in the last few years. Um, but the, the, if we are, if the U.S. is doing trainings, then then it shouldn't just be a half-hour human rights training thrown in, provided by security contractors who themselves have been implicated in trafficking and sexual violence and exploitation. It has to become the core. It has to be the essence of peacekeeping, the protection and service to communities. There's a, there's a critical role um, uh, there that, that we need. And then finally, on the question of rape, whether it's in co college campuses or in the US military or elsewhere, we talk a lot about prosecution, but in most of the countries we're working in, prosecution is a distant dream. And the question for me is going back to how the shifting of the shame and the shifting of the fear onto the perpetrator really is also a cultural issue because what, what is the young soldier who rapes in the US Army, what is he most afraid of? Let's work on that. Let's give him, let's put that fear on the table and maybe that will prevent it. Whether that's in DRC or whether it's in Iraq and, and, and elsewhere. And I think that, that we have so many different ways of engaging the community to bring accountability to their governments from the grassroots, but then they need the support from, from, from the international community. It's, it's a matter of political will. And um, we're reaching a point where some, some of us in the room have thought about this, that the UN came out of the ashes of World War II. Do we have to wait for new ashes for us to rethink the world you know, as it is? Really, we shouldn't. So the, the big ideas that have emerged in our conversations here should become the center stage of, of moving forward. And it should be a collaboration between people on the ground who are, the, who are feeling the impact. And many of the policymakers, or uh, you know, I almost call them so-called leaders, who really have no sense of responsibility. Um, let's put these people together and think about, about the future. And, and I'll give you one example of something we're doing. At this, at, at, in New York, at the Commission on the Status of Women next month, we're having a mirror panel on the U UN Peace Operations uh, Review. They have, I don't know, 16 or 17 figures who are reviewing the UN operations, and it's mainly men with a handful of women. We're doing a reverse. We're doing the ratio women to men, so it's going to be majority women, few men. <laughs> And we're trying to find people who are from the countries that have had UN presence there to tell us what the UN should do, as opposed to the same people who led those operations saying what they should do, because many of them have actually led flawed programs. So, so this, this issue of reversing and hearing from the so-called beneficiaries has to become center stage in all of the work we do. Thank you. Well, that's a perfect way, and I want to give uh, President Carter and Senator Gillibrand a chance to, to speak. Well, <clears throat> we're very excited to have Kirsten here. And and she has to leave in a few minutes. But I wanted to ask her, finally, uh, what can this group collectively do to help you? And uh, we're going to send a delegation to Washington to meet with the women's leaders and to meet with other people, including some folks at the White House. And so you, you let us know what we can do either now with a brief remarks or following up with me directly or, or with uh, Karen. Mm -hmm. Because we, when we come to, to Washington, which we usually do after we have one of these sessions, and share our views with the news media and so forth, we want to be helpful to what you're doing. Well, it, it's really quite simple. Um, the ideas that I've just been able to listen to in these few minutes have been incredibly intelligent and uh, will be transformational when implemented. So I think it's most important to be heard. I really believe that the voices in this room don't make it to every table of power, to every decision maker. Uh, one of the calls to action in, in, in my work is to ask women to vote, to become advocates, to run for office, to support other women running for office. Because when women are in a leadership role, they are in a position to make decisions about where to spend resources, about 
where to prioritize. All the studies show that when women are in positions of leadership, that community will invest in things like healthcare and education and clean water and clean air as opposed to munitions, arms, and war fighting. That is their instinct is to build communities, not to tear them down. And so my, my whole approach is the importance of, of voices, women's voices and men's voices who share this ideal that women's life experiences and women's perspectives are important and are not being represented. The views being expressed here are not the mainstream in Washington. They're not the mainstream in our nation's capital. They are not the mainstream in capitals all over the world. It is just not the case. And it is because overwhelmingly women do not hold positions of power overwhelmingly. So women have to seek out positions of power. They have to seek out the ear of those in power. And they have to become more transactional. Women don't ask for anything. We elect nearly every elected leader in this country, in the United States, women's vote is responsible for the outcomes of elections. President Obama is the president of the United States because the women voters overwhelmingly supported him. Did the women of America ask for anything? No. We don't have equal pay in this country. We don't have a livable minimum wage in this country. We don't have paid leave. We are literally the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't have a paid leave program. It's problematic, and so we need to demand the issues and the results and the outcomes that we're talking about, and we need to be more forceful. We need to be uh, aggressive. We need to be unrelenting, and women are the caregivers. We are the holders of what is best for our communities. We feel it. We live it. We breathe it. We bleed it but we do not aggrandize power and we don't ask for power. That has to change or we will continue to fail. What I noticed about this organization and everyone that was here today, many of you have been working for decades, literally decades, and how far have we moved the needle? The answer is not far enough. Women and girls are still the instruments of war. Women and girls are still considered something to be owned. Women and girls' voices are not important in too many halls of power, and that includes the United States. So I share everyone's ambitions here and goals, and I want to work with all of you in trying to achieve them. But something has to change or we will not succeed. And I think it has a lot to do with owning our ambitions, owning our power, using our voices, and being heard. Well, that was a fantastic way to end. You can count on it. We're going to be in touch with you. We, I promise to get you in your car because you have somewhere to be. Um, thank you for being with us thank very you. much. Perhaps um, we can. Thank you. And if you, everybody could stay seated until Senator Gillibrand and President Carter, they both have somewhere to get real quickly. So we'll thank wrap you. up and be on our way. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, as we mentioned, we're, we, President Carter mentioned, um, a few of us will be in Washington, D.C. next week, so we're going to try to continue this conversation. Um, we're going to wrap up now um, and move to lunch. Um, I just have one, an, a couple of announcements. We have, um, some people have been asking for Susan's wonderful summary. We will make that available um, at some point today for you to have uh, in writing, uh, the, the printout of that. And also, um, we have a declaration, a statement that we've drafted for this conference, um, and I'm going to, we're going to have that circulated at lunchtime, so you have time to read what we have captured. It's brief, somewhat brief, um, but we want you to add any, any ideas that you have, mostly commitments. The Carter Center is committed. We're, uh, we have this website. We're going to demonstrate it tomorrow. That's our commitment to keep the conversation going and to convene and to support in any way we can. But as uh, Ambassador Peters mentioned this morning, we want you to be thinking about the commitments you'll make. So when you read the declaration, please either write on a piece of paper or email us what your commitment will be to that, uh, to that statement. Um, join us for lunch and you will be guided to the location of the lunch and we'll get started right after that. Thank you so much. <laughs>